actually collecting my, my son from school and the phone rang and I answered it and he said, Michelle, he said there has been a body found on the, the Fawn Legowan farm and I remember just, I heard nothing after that. I never even heard my, my son getting into the back of the car. I was just paralysed. Tipperary is situated in the province of Munster in the southern region of Ireland and is the sixth largest county and is the largest landlocked county. It is most famous for its two castles, Caer Castle and the Rock of Cashel, although there's plenty more to this beautiful county. Tipperary Town is the central location of my story today. It is surrounded by prime farming land and has a landscape of rolling pastures and looming hills. It's a land that returns a good living to those who farm it well. As one local put it, there are no hippies here to introduce their cosmopolitan ways. Bobby Ryan was 52 years of age from just outside Cashel County Tipperary. He was separated and had two grown up children and he was a granddad. He worked at a Kalak quarry near Thurlis as a lorry driver, but his favourite job was working as a DJ at the weekends and he called himself Mr Moonlight. He loved this gig and was a very popular man about the county. He'd have you up dancing in a minute. Next, I'm going to introduce you to the woman at the centre of this story, Mary. Mary loved to dance and she met her husband, Martin Lowry, at a dance back in the 80s. They hit it off and got married in 1995. Martin was a farmer all his life on his family's 50 acre farm at Fawnagown and he had more land at Bancha. After they got married, they moved into Fawnagown Farm and built an extension onto the house for Martin's mother, Rita, to live in. They had three sons together and were pretty happy. Both places were just outside Tipperary town. Mary continued working after they got married, but when the boys came along, she stayed at home. Martin was the eldest boy, followed by two brothers and four sisters. The important person to take note of here is Martin's sister, Imelda. She was married to Pat Quirk, a dairy farmer from Breen Chamore, again just outside Tipperary town. Mary said Martin and Pat Quirk were not close. They'd share machinery, they had some investments together, they were brother-in-laws and they'd meet at family gatherings, but that was about it. Pat would beg to differ, or investments, that Martin had put together for her and the children. It was a very vulnerable time for her. She had no husband and three small children and no idea how to run a farm. So in steps Pat Quirk to lend a hand and a hand it would be. He offered to look after her investments and advise her on the farm. He leased 63 acres from her for 12,600 to be paid twice a year. By January 2008, Quirk and Mary's friendship developed into a full-blown affair which would go on for the next two years. They'd meet up on Mondays and Fridays at her house after the boys went to school. Mary felt terrible and she tried to end the affair many a time, but Quirk wasn't having any of it. He was totally controlling and manipulative and Mary had no one to turn to. Quirk said if she told anyone, her family and friends would disown her and she'd be the talk of the town and she should be grateful. Being a woman with three small children and a widow, no one else would have her. Mary felt trapped and powerless when it came to Quirk. He persuaded Mary to appoint him and his wife Imelda as guardians in case anything should happen to her and they'd look after the boys. She wrote a will leaving them €100,000 to extend their home to accommodate the boys. He also borrowed €20,000, which Mary never saw again. When asked why she started the affair, she stated that she hadn't had sex in a few years because of her late husband's illness, and she was lonely and Quirk was there looking after her and the boys. By summer 2010, Mary finally broke off the affair with Quirk, but he didn't go quietly. In August of that same year, Mary was to meet Bobby Ryan. He got her tickets to the All-Ireland Hurling Final and they got on like a house on fire. Bobby asked her out and Mary was delighted. She didn't have to hide this relationship and Bobby was a tonic. Full of life, loved to dance and had a very sociable job as a DJ. Mary was truly smitten. By early 2011, Mary and Bobby were in a full-blown relationship. Martin's mother, Rita, was delighted for Mary. She was too young to be sitting at home and spending the best years of her life alone. Things were finally coming together for Mary. 
but in the background was Quirk and he was foaming at the mouth. He was not a happy camper. Quirk would start a series of events that would eventually lead to the murder of an innocent man through his obsession with Mary and the greed of money. Quirk began a campaign against Mary and he was determined to get her back or bring her down. One morning she came home and her front door was open and there was Quirk inside and he frightened the life out of her. He said she had left it open but she knew she hadn't. On Valentine's Day 2011 she got a letter from CPS accusing her of not looking after her boys and that she was leaving them on their own. Which wasn't true as Martin's mother lived in the same house and she'd look after the boys if she needed to go out. Mary didn't have to look far as to who reported her, but of course Quirk denied it. Anyway, she got the all clear from the CPS, but this was very upsetting for her. Once Mary was in Quirk's company and he grabbed her phone when she got a message from Bobby and he wrote back to him, I'm the man. Bobby was not well pleased and wanted to sort this out once and for all. And so the three of them arranged to meet in Hayes' hotel in Thurless and Quirk told him that Mary was his. Bobby in turn told him that if he didn't leave Mary alone, he would tell his wife of the affair. On February the 20th, 2011, Mary bought the Irish Independent newspaper and like us all went to the problem page and it read about a man still being in love with the woman he had had an affair with. While Mary could have been knocked over with a feather when she recognised the scenario stated in the letter, she rang Quirk and he admitted to writing into the newspaper. She was not impressed. On May 27, 2011, Mary and Bobby decided to go away to Bundoran for a weekend of dancing. Bobby wasn't feeling well and didn't want to dance. Mary ended up dancing with another man and Bobby was not well pleased. So he chatted to another woman and ignored Mary for the night. On the way home after the weekend, they had a blazing row and Bobby said they should take a break. But by June, things were back on track. So on June the 2nd, 2011, the night before Bobby would disappear, Mary had been messaging him. I'm not so sure how well back on track they were because according to Bobby's son, he seemed annoyed with the messages and he was asking his son's girlfriend what he should do about Mary. But in the heel of the hunt, he decided that he would go see Mary that night to see what was wrong with her. He arrived about 10.30 p.m. at Mary's and parked his van outside the house. He stayed that night and they had a bit of, how's your father, before he left the next morning about 6.30 a.m. When he left the house, she noticed it took him longer than usual to start the van and hear him go over the cattle grid at the bottom of the drive, but she wasn't concerned. She later got up and saw Quirk passing through the yard around 8.30 a.m. This was unusual as Quirk would never come to the farm until around midday. She got her boys ready, dropped them to school and dropped her mother-in-law to the doctors and was home by 9.30 a.m. At around 10.30 a.m. Michelle Ryan, Bobby's daughter, rang her, looking for her dad and told her he was missing and that he never showed up for work. Then his son Robert arrived at the house and Mary told him to check the lakes as she knew Bobby suffered from depression and he might have taken his own life. Mary arranged to meet Michelle in Tipperary town to report Bobby missing to the Gardaí and after doing so Michelle suggested to go to Kilshane Woods which is about two kilometres away from Mary's house. When they arrived lo and behold there was Bobby's van unlocked which Bobby would never do. The seat had also been moved, which Michelle noticed. The Gardaí and search and rescue arrived and the woods were combed. This went on for weeks and months after, but no sign of Bobby. The Gardaí searched Mary's farm also with her permission and with the help of Quirk. The Gardaí asked him how many slurry pits were they and he told them two. What he didn't tell them was there was actually three. The third was a runoff pit that was unused and constructed in the 1970s behind the milking parlour. Mary was really feeling the pressure as the months went by and there was a secret she was keeping that she knew she had to tell. She contacted the woman in charge of Bobby's search and told her about the affair. This woman told her she'd have to tell the Gardaí, but she didn't. So the woman went and told the Gardaí herself and Mary was interviewed. 
After the disappearance of Bobby, Quirk was crawling back into Mary's life and pretending to be her friend. He tried to rekindle their affair and pestered her to no end. She even agreed to go away for a night in Dublin with Quirk. She said they didn't have sex, but she got very drunk and didn't remember a whole lot. She just didn't want to be there. Eventually it came out that Quirk, over a period of time after Bobby disappeared, had been at Mary's house at all times of the day and night. The alarm on the house kept going off, so she got a CCTV system installed, which Quirk didn't know about. And what she captured was Quirk going around her yard, peeping in the windows and stealing her underwear from the clothesline. She didn't make a formal complaint to the Gardaí because Quirk had just lost his 11 year old son in August 2012 when Quirk drove over him by accident on the farm. She instead asked her solicitor to write to Quirk to terminate the lease to the farm by July 2013. On the 30th of April 2013 Mary arrived home to Quirk and the Gardaí there they informed her a body had been found in a runoff pit on the property. Mary had no idea that this pit existed. She was asked to leave the property upon investigation and Mary would never return to the house again to live. On the morning the body was found, as the story goes, Quirk decided to sort the two slurry pits and needed water to break it up. He went to the third pit as he thought it would be full of water. When he opened it, put the hose in, he saw what he thought was a body. He rang his wife Imelda who arrived a short time later. She peered in and saw the body also. She then rang the guardy, and when they arrived Quirk and Imelda were sitting on the wall. The guarda noticed that Quirk was spotless and not dressed to do slurry that day. The guardy called for backup and when they peered into the pit they saw skeletal remains that had no clothes on and he was face down with his arms by his side. Gardy rang the state pathologist Dr Khalid Jabber to attend the scene and he refused to. So the Gardaí took it upon themselves to remove the body and as they did so one of the concrete slabs broke and fell on top of the body. They climbed down into the pit to put the body on a tarp to get it out and as they did so one of the arms fell off which was very upsetting to one of the retrievers of the body. This was all happening a hundred feet from the place he was last seen at the house of Mary Larry at Fawnagown Farm. Quirk staged this day as he knew he was running out of time and needed the body to be found before his lease was up in July 2013. He couldn't risk the new leasers finding the body. The body was removed to have a post-mortem done by Dr Jabber. He stated that Bobby had died from severe head injuries that could not have been caused by falling into the pit. He said it was due to blows to the head by a baseball bat or a blunt object, causing bleeding to the brain and causing death. Dr Jabber did not attend court to give evidence as he was unavailable. Professor Crane, a consultant pathologist and former state pathologist for Northern Ireland, stood in to give evidence after referring to Dr Jabber's report. Professor Crane identified fractures to Bobby's head, nine of his ribs and his thigh bone. He said that Dr Jabber should have attended the scene to get in situ evidence and supervise the removal of the body. He feels that there was evidence lost because Dr Jabber had not been there. The level of decomposition was consistent to death occurring around June 2011 when Bobby was last seen. Professor Crane also noted that the relatively limited insect infestation was from the body having been inside the sealed pit rather than exposed to the outside environment. A blowfly was present on the body and studies showed that the particular stage of growth the blowfly was at showed that the pit had been open a few weeks before the body was found by the accused. This was huge evidence in the trial and studying Quirk's computer he had searched on it asking about the different stages of decomposition of a body. Quirk stated that it was because he had lost his son in August 2012. But the Gardaí came back at him and said one of the searches was before his son died. Bobby's body wasn't found for 22 months and at the trial Gardaí were blamed for not getting a warrant and searching Mary's farm properly and finding the third tank. Some other evidence that was found on the computer would have furthered Quirk's guilt but was not allowed to be used in the trial. 
Quirk had searched the Joe O'Reilly murder and how to get away with the perfect murder. There were audio clips of Mary, Larry and Quirk engaged in sexual activity. They also found a note that looked planted in his house, questioning Mary and pointing suspicion in her direction. But further to inspection, it showed secret indentations of a to-do list connected to the murder of Bobby. Quirk pleaded not guilty and it was the longest running trial in the state's history at the time. The jury of six men and six women deliberated 20 hours over 20 days after 15 weeks of trial in the Central Criminal Court in Dublin. The verdict came back on the 1st of May 2019 as guilty and Quirk was sentenced to life in prison. Imelda Quirk stood by her husband all through the trial and still does to this day. Her loyalty has alienated her from her family and friends and she still lives on the farm at Braincha outside Tipperary Town. Mary Larry never lived again on the Fonagown farm where Bobby's body was found. She moved about 10 kilometres down the road and built a new home there, surrounded by a lot of land and she keeps herself to herself. Bobby's children are in the process of suing Pat Quirk for Bobby's death. No details have been released of the terms they are suing for. Michelle and Robert left Tipperary and moved to Cork as it was too painful to stay. Pat Quirk appealed straight after the verdict, but it was denied in November 2021. But it was put forward that he can appeal again. Quirk is currently residing in Portleash Prison, the only maximum security prison in Ireland. He gets the perks of a lifer, or as they call it, lifer's order. They put in a list of things they want and an officer goes down to the local supermarket and gets it weekly. It is believed Quirk works in the kitchen and gives no trouble whatsoever, so he is known as an enhanced prisoner, the top level of three categories. Imelda Quirk was cheated on by her husband. Months later, after she found out, her 11-year-old son was killed and within a year her husband was arrested for murder and eventually found guilty. This woman and her family have suffered unbelievable losses and my heart goes out to her. The ties between these two families, the Larrys and the Quirks, is crystallised in St Michael's Cemetery. There lies Martin Larry, Mary's husband, Martin's father John and for Imelda her son Alan also lies there beside them. Two women no longer speaking must come to the same grave to mourn their loved ones. People never forget, especially in a rural setting like Tipperary. This legacy will be passed down from generation to generation. The Quirk family name will be forever tied to the man who killed Bobby Ryan.